Welcome to Behind the Black Belt, a podcast about the people and black belts of BJJ. Welcome to Behind the Black Belt. I'm your host, Rich, and my guest today is BJJ Black Belt, Matt DeQuino. Now, Matt is the owner and head coach of Beyond Grappling Club in Canberra, Australia. As a fourth degree judo black belt, Matt is also a two-time Australian judo champion, a multiple-time Oceanian champion, and he also competed in judo at the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing. Now, Matt has... Matt has made a series of DVDs and videos which are readily available through both BJJ and judofanatics.com. And he is also an accomplished author with multiple books about judo, goal setting, and his Olympic journey. Matt DeQuino, welcome to Behind the Black Belt, and thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> It's the one time that you, you you have an excuse to do it. I'm going to force you to talk about yourself. No, That's so funny. No pressure. All right, Matt. Look, we are very excited to have you on the show, and uh, so 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 many questions to ask you. So let's get straight into it. Um, Matt, why don't you start us off by telling us where were you born and where were you raised? Yes, I was born in Canberra. There and you go. In Canberra, so there's not many people in Canberra are born here. They usually move away or move here. Yep. Uh, I don't know why. It's a great city. It's a great place to raise a family. Yep. Um, it's pretty slow. So yeah, I was um, yeah, born and raised in, in Canberra, Australia. Awesome. Which, which part of Canberra were you born in? So I was born in the south side, so in the Tuggerong area, and okay. I'm, still there. I'm still here now. Awesome. I awesome. club there, you know, that sort of stuff. My whole life is south side Canberra. South side Canberra. And for those, those podcaster listeners that are listening, you can't see Matt. I see Matt wearing at least two jumpers, maybe a jumper and a jacket. So he is, right. he is Canberra through and through. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Um, so how did your family find themselves in Canberra, Matt? Yeah, so um, I think my mum was just been here for a long time and um, yeah, started having kids and away we went to school and my sister's here, my brother's here, my mum's here. So I got awesome. a family, you know, five minutes away. And if you don't know Canberra, everywhere is close in Canberra. Like we can drive from the furthest house on one side to the furthest house on the other side, probably takes you 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes. It's a pretty small city. Um, so it's just easy to get around, easy to catch up with mates and that sort of stuff. Cool. And the sort of south side of Canberra there, uh, is it, is it when you were growing up, is it sort of small kind of country living or sort of bit of, bit of sort of just suburban kind of growing up? Yeah, just suburban really. Yeah, just suburban. And what did Matt DeQuino do as a kid? Oh, I played uh, a million different sports. So I started judo when I was about five and a half. Wow. Um, and, um, and then... Pretty much through my whole life, I did judo and cricket, judo and rugby league, judo and hockey, judo and, you know, so, um, yeah, so I just played rugby league um, for 11 years and did judo pretty much. From awesome. Home. Awesome. Yeah. And what did your parents do? Uh, well, I never met my dad. Um, he okay. left when I was young. So, uh, but my mum just worked part time um, as a receptionist and then looked after, you know, uh, my brother and my sister and me. And was she the one that sort of got you into judo at a, such a young age? Yeah, yeah. Well, she, um, me and my brother wrestled all the time. I was the youngest. Okay. We wrestled all the time and she was sick of it. So she threw us into a local PCYC. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and I just loved doing judo. I loved it because I'm small. So I went to the Olympics at 60 kilos. Yeah. So uh, I love the fact that I could beat bigger, stronger people using just my speed and my technique and that sort of stuff. So that's cool. Yeah, that's how we got started in judo. That's cool. And tell us about, do you, do you remember judo as a child, sort of what you loved about it? You know, besides, you know, throwing sort of bigger people around. What, as a yeah. child, it's hard to stick to things for so long. What, what got you stuck to judo? I think I stuck with it because when I was good at it, and most kids like what they're good at. Like, of and they're more likely to, and I won tournaments at a young age. And um, so I think I just like it. And it was just fun, you know, playing British Bulldogs and sumo and all those sort of games. Yeah. Um, it was really fun. So, um, and we got to go to tournaments as a family or as a club and hanging out with your coaches. Now as I got older, you know, my, my mentors were my coaches. So hanging out with them on trips and that was just so good. Awesome. And, um, so I think I just followed in their footsteps. And did your, did your siblings stay in judo as sort of fanatically, if you will, as you did? Yeah. So um, my brother probably stopped judo. He won the national championships as a junior a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, my sister as well medaled at like the Oceania champs and that sort of stuff. But um, she's involved just at a managerial level. Okay. And my brother, you know, we work takes over as life, you know, 
gets tricky. Um, yeah. He's just bringing his kids now to judo and I'll get him on the mat soon. So <laughs> yeah. The best way is probably just to surprise him. Without him knowing, get him back on the mat. That's right. That's right. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And uh, Matt, what kind of student were you at, at school? Uh, well, funnily enough, my mum gave me a pack of all like my school reports and stuff like that. So I was just reading through them. And it was funny that in some classes, I, Matt's disruptive and he talks all the time. And it's pretty much the same. I am. I do talk all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and if he applied himself a bit more, but other classes, as Matt's a great student and blah, blah, blah. And I think it's just mainly like most students, if they're, if they like the content, then they behave and they, they do the, um, you know, they do the work and they, and they have fun. And at the moment, I, I was a primary school trained teacher. And during COVID, I've gone back to teaching primary yeah. school. And yeah, sometimes when kids muck around in my classes, I go, is that just because your classes are boring, Matt? Like, yeah, okay. Bored. Is that why they're mucking around? And then sometimes it, it's easy to blame the kid, but sometimes it's just um, hmm. the teacher's boring. Was, it, so, was there, as you, get, as you went through those reports, was there a pattern, was it the subjects or do you think it was the teachers themselves that, that sparked that interest in you at a young age? Maybe a little bit of both. Okay. Um, you definitely remember your good teachers and your bad teachers, don't for you? Sure. Um, for sure, for sure. And, uh, but I do know all the PE ones were always, the physical education ones were all like, Matt's a great athlete and tries his hardest and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I pretty yeah. much had my identity in sport really. Like I was a machine, I was good at a lot of different sports and stuff like that. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned as a kid, you sort of, you played rugby and you played cricket as well. So it was always, mm -hmm. judo was always that foundation and, but you yeah. went off to play these other team sports. Was there, was there a contrast between this individual kind of martial arty uh, sport that you did and then you, you do this team sport as well? Was there a difference there or were they one the same for you? I think it was the same. Yeah. Okay. Like I think um, I just did it cause it was fun and, um, and I was good at them all. Um, yeah. But in terms of individual, I don't know. I think um, it was just fun. It's just what yeah. we did. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then sort of growing, growing up as a kid, Matt, would you, did you have any sort of role models or inspirations that you kind of looked up to? Yeah, yeah. So all my judo coaches. So um, uh, so Tom and Steve Hill and, and uh, that sort of stuff. So all my coaches were my, were my role models and my mentors. So I, I saw them travel the world um, mm. competing and training and, um, and they're great people. They're really nice, they're really loving and all that sort of stuff. So they were my mentors. Um, yeah. So another guy, John Watkins, was a good mentor of mine as well. He's now one of the coaches at my club, one of the judo coaches. Um, wow, that's cool. Really, yeah, really cool. So um, actually, I was only saying to my wife yesterday because uh, my judo coaches run their club. And they now have another business and I run mine. I, kind of was, I nearly gave him a call here saying, like, oh, I just miss seeing you guys, you know? Like, I miss yeah, yeah, yeah. around the place and that sort of stuff. So they were my mentors growing up and, and that sort of stuff, yeah. And did you have any sort of aspirations or ideas when you were a young kid, sort of what you wanted to do when you grew up? Nah, but my mum was always like, you guys can achieve like whatever you want. You just got to mm. work hard and do that sort of stuff. And when I was 12, um, my coach Tom was trying to make the Sydney Olympics yep. and he went to the US Open and came second. And it was around that time that, which pretty much, pretty much security sport in the Sydney Olympics. Yeah. And when he came home and he showed us his medals, I was like, that's what I want to do. So when I was about 12, or 13, I think I was 12. I was like, I want to get Olympics for judo. Like, that's what I want to do. Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah, really, that was really my driving force from, from then on. And then, and then at that moment, did that, that, when you made that decision, did that change how you applied yourself to judo or how you, you approached judo? No, like I already trained pretty hard. So we trained at a club where, so I trained at one club, which is a recreational club uh, from pretty much five to maybe eight. And the coach said to my mum, your two kids are pretty good at judo. Like, um, your two boys are pretty good at judo. But if they stay here, we're a recreational club. They're not going to get better. But if you want them to get to the next level, then you need to go to the club up the road where all those guys, some of them have went to the Atlanta Olympics. They're all training for the Sydney Olympics. It's a competitive club. So should we move to that club so we can be around the competitive environment? So... Um, yes, I was straight away involved in com competition judo at a young age. So we did tournaments from five and a half. I started tournaments at five and a half years old. Yeah, so yeah. I would do 10, 12 tournaments a year, if not more. Um, yeah, wow. Um, yeah, so. So for the, for the uninitiated, like myself, can you explain the difference between a focus on sport or competitive judo versus recreational yeah. judo? No, I mean, recreational is just, you know, you do it two, three times a week. You try to learn all the different techniques and, and you just kind of go there and have fun. 
Mm. Um, competitors are a little bit more, they don't have as much fun at training. They still mm. need to have fun, but they're more focused on honing their skills at a, at, at a higher level. Um, and they just train harder. They fight harder. They do more rounds of sparring. Yeah. Um, they're just more intense. And so, you know, um, yeah, and that's kind of, that's it. So, for example, uh, recreational guys, they're more than happy to do, throw up 10 triangles. And they're, what's the, coach, what's next? Like, yeah. What, yeah. what's the next move? Because I've done it 10 times. Where competitors are like, I've done 100, and then I'm just going to keep going. Like, they just yeah, keep okay. repping and repping. And so, I guess a bit more focused and um, yeah. higher in level of intensity. And that, that sort of concept between a, a competition focus versus a recreational focus, does that transcend into jiu-jitsu as well, you think? Oh, big time. Yeah, big yeah, time. Okay. Um, okay. And that's why, you know, different clubs have competition classes. And um, okay. where even at my club at the moment, this year before COVID, it was the first year I finally split my beginner's class into uh, fundamental jiu-jitsu and advanced jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and, and my judo is advanced judo and beginner jiu-jitsu or fundamental. So we're starting to separate it because there's I'm not talking about belts, but just there's competitive people that want to they want to roll for an hour. Yeah, okay. The okay. recreational guys are like, I don't want to roll for an hour. I just want to come in, learn some moves, roll for twenty minutes, and go home. Yeah. So you can't after a while you can't put those two together because the competitors are lying to just wreck wreck the recreational player. The recreational player gets injured. They don't have fun. They want to avoid those people. So you need to funnel the competitive people into a class where they can rip each other's heads off and be happy about it and come back the following night and do it again. So, yeah. yeah that's fascinating because you're right because the gym is going to have both of those camps, you know. Yeah. Can, can you have a recreational player that's going to achieve in a competition sort of sense as well, you think? Or, or you know, if they really want to take it seriously, do they, have to, do they have to have that focus? I think both. You need to have both. Yeah. The, but I think it's just it all comes down to mindset. So even okay. now, like, like when I was competitive, like I'm a different person now, but when I was competitive, if someone had me an armbar, I'd fight to the death to get out of it in training. Now yeah. I'm like, yeah, tap. Before it's even honest, just halfway out, I'll just tap out. And sure. you know, but as a competitor, you just, you just at a high level of intensity. Um, yeah. But what I mean is now that I'm not competitive, when I compete, if it, like I get to like 70% or maybe 80%. I'm like, oh, that's enough. Like I don't, I, I can't push any further mentally to yep. push through pain. Like I'm just, I've had, I've done that. So I'm still competitive, but not at a hundred percent level. I'm like, yeah. Hey. So, so yeah, but there's, you can be a recreational all the time, but it just means in tournament, the com competitive guys usually just dig that 20% deeper than you. Sometimes you still beat them, but uh, yeah. after a while, the, you know, the competitive guys just kind of just take over competitions. And there's an element where competitions is skill in itself. There's plenty okay. of people who can win tournaments, but actually not that good, but they can win tournaments because it's a skill to, to warm up and play a referee and, and all that sort of stuff. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. I've never thought of any of that. That's fascinating. You know, you're describing the, this competition side, which is intensity and, and, and you describe the physical intensity of doing, of just, you know, rolling for an hour, but also this mental intensity that has to come with that, where, you know, you have to push yourself beyond the 80%, beyond the 90% if you want to be that really true competitor. And if I don't, if I don't circle back on it, you, you got to talk about how you, how you can just approach being this competition player as well, like pay, playing the ref and the warm ups and all that. That's fascinating. And, and I was going to say, um, say um, for you, like, put it into a military context, like the, the guys that want to make is that the SAS is the one where they do like super hard training. Yeah, the, yeah. Really, the guys that make it are the only guys that actually want to make it. Yeah. yeah. Mentally. The guys yeah. that are like, I'll give it a crack. And if I, yeah, you know, I might get in, they never get in. Yeah. The only guys that get in are the guys that want to get in and competitions are same. The yeah. guys that want to win will win. The guys who don't really care, they're probably not going to win. Yeah. That's it's fascinating. It is, it's the same, right? Like the, the trainings, the, SAS selection is super hard to weed out people that don't really want it. Yeah. Yeah. Competitions are same. Yeah. It's fascinating. That's, That's fascinating. why there's blue belts that are wrecking machines because it is competitive as, and they can yeah. wreck black belts. Cause they're like, dude, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight that hard, man. I'm just going to tap it out. Of it. Yeah. It, it's all good. Like it's whatever. I think so, everyone, everyone knows those blue belts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or white belts. It could be any belt. You know? Yeah, you're right. You're like, right. So, just, yeah. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, that, that's really cool. Um, let's go back to Matt DeQuino. Matt, so when you're at this, uh, your, your teens, your high school years, um, are, we, are we talking about, are you the same type of person? You're still real focused on your judo, still focused on your sport. You're still doing well at school through your high school years? 
Yeah, I just like, I just got my work done. So I would like, um, if I had an assignment due, I would do it at lunchtime in the library so that I could, I could go training in the afternoon. Um, so I, training was my focus. So okay. I never let school work from what I can know. I never let school work get in the way of training. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes people at my club, ones that want to be competition junior players, be like, oh, I can't come to training tonight because I've got an assignment to do. I'll be like, oh, that's cool. Like, what do you do at lunch times? And they're like, oh, I'll just play soccer with my friends. I'm like, well, go and do your assignment then. Like, I suck them into it. So yeah, I, I ask them what do they do at lunchtime and then they tell me, okay, yeah. you do your assignment at lunchtime so you don't miss training. So I was just a, almost a head in the sand. I only had one focus, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. And, and so that application to judo, again, in high school, as, as your subjects become more complex and diverse, did you... Did you apply that sort of same mantra to your school or was it just, just sort of, it was just get that done so you can go back to your judo? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah so okay. I think my, my UAI was like, I think I got like 65 or something like that, my university entrance. Yeah, so not the yeah. highest of scores, but I wasn't really interested. Sure. Um, I knew, what, I, I already knew pretty much at like high school, college that I would try to make the Olympics first and then do university afterwards. Right, so okay. I mean, university and then. So it all depends on, you know, timings and ages and all that sort of stuff. But that's what I ended up doing was Olympics first and then university. Okay. So the, so the plan in high school was to get to the Olympics. Yeah. And tell me, Matt, you know, is that a realistic plan as a teenager because of how well you're doing in your competitions? Is that, is that the, the sort of metric that, 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 you know, that, that study would be something that would happen after this Olympic pursuit? Uh, oh, everyone's different. Really? Okay. Like, it's kind of like, my mum wasn't like, you must go to university. Like some families are like, no, you'll need, you, you go and get a degree, like culturally, like sure. I got a degree, your mum's got a degree. Dad, you're going to go to uni and get a degree and judo as well. So that's kind of, but in, in my family, it was just like, yeah, you can go to the university. Don't you have to do that? Like, yeah. So, okay. Um, but in terms of the students, like in my club now, that because they might say, I want to go to Olympics. I'd be like, well, well, talk to your parents about it because yeah. one, it's a massive, you know, it's a team family um, focused thing. It's not just all about me. Like my mom had to help and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, but I also think being good in high school doesn't really matter. I was just talking to, I wish I had some people over this morning and I was just saying, um, that heaps of people make state teams and national teams at 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And by 18, when the going gets tough to make the senior team, that is quit. And they don't like, I know so many people that were state level, Australian level, rugby, soccer, swimming, netball, basketball. None of them do those sports anymore. Mm. Because they were just naturally gifted at it. And mm. so they got naturally selected. But to make the senior team of any sport, you have to be digging deep and sacrificing stuff. And that's about the age where girlfriends and jobs started yeah, coming. And, yeah. people, and you meet people all the time and go, yeah, I could have, oh, yeah, I played for the Junior Raiders or the Junior yeah. Broncos or the Junior Brumbies. And then I just quit. I'm like, yeah, it's because you were just naturally good at it. Mm. And then when you started getting other things, it wasn't worth it. So you quit. Mm. So even if you are not a winner in teenage years, no one cares. It's actually yeah. a long-term game. Okay. Of, um, sticking with it and, and bouncing back when you do lose and stuff like that. Well, talk us through Matt. So you, the, your high school years and then what's the next step for you? So you, you, you finish high school. Yep. And then where, where does, where does Matt go from there? Yeah, so I went to a Arendelle College, which was like a talented sports program school. Okay. So I got, obviously got in for judo, um, and I literally just spent all the time in the gym. So wow. same thing, just got all my... Uh, and I was just walking past there the other day, and I'm like, I can't really remember college. Like, I can't remember it. I think yeah. I just spent all the time at the PCYC, in the gym with my friends, just hanging out and, and training and, and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, but I guess for like goal setting, I had to make the like the junior national team. So I did that when I was like in year ten, mm -hmm. and then I, my coach said you got to make the senior team. So by the end of year twelve, I made the senior Australian team, mm -hmm. and then I started going overseas to like America and Canada competing. Okay, um, when I was eighteen, and that was that would have been two thousand and two, two thousand and three. Yeah, and then um, I was on the shadow team for the Athens Olympics two thousand and four. Um, and then, yeah, so okay. I was just trained and worked at ran bir kids' birthday parties at like a fun factory place. Yep. yep. Uh, it was a cool job. And then I worked at a service station on weekends. Yeah, okay. Tell us about these overseas trips, Matt. Is it sort of going there, staying in hotels, kind of 
kind of, and then, and then you're de- just there to compete. Yeah. Um, and what, what's, what's the kind of environment like? Because judo has been such an international sport for such a long time in comparison to BJJ. D- does it feel like it has an international fa- flavor or are you all there and you're, you're all doing the same sport and it doesn't matter what nationality you're from, it's judo is the, is the crux of your, your trips overseas when you're competing. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I think it's just cool. Like, um, yeah, like if you go to a trip, you'll stay in the official hotel because if you don't, you get a fine. <laughs> so you've got to stay. Yeah, right. you know, so uh, you'll stay in the official hotel and there's just people from so many different countries like Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Vietnam, like America, Canada, Russia. Like it's really cool. What, why would uh, they find you for not staying in the official hotel? It is a, a money, you know, money spin. Yeah, okay, you know? okay, all right. And it's, like, it's not, it still is an element where, you know, you can stay here for 400 bucks a night or you, yeah. and you go, I'll just stay at the hotel down the road. They go, yeah, you can do that because it's 50 bucks a night, but we're going to charge you $400 to stay. Yeah, there. right. Okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And and is everyone, everyone in this, when you go over there, was everyone just like eyeing each other off as you're walking around the hotel? Is everyone just you know who's that do i have to throw that guy do i have to compete against that guy well i mean yeah there's an element of that like is that like in your weight division like oh my gosh is that takato or is, yeah 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 is that normal or like you know so you see the the guys you watch on tv and that sort of stuff like oh man and they're in your weight division or you look at the first time you look at the drawer and you see like olympians and world champions in your division yeah wow like i'm actually fighting alongside them and it's pretty cool that's pretty cool. Were you were you a bit starstruck by that, or were you just like, "All right, here's my here's my next sort of challenge. Here's the, here's oh. the level I'm at now." Yeah, no, I, I don't think I was ever at that level. Like, it is next level. But um, yeah, it is. It is like um, so we we went to a place where Jimmy Pedro, who's a famous judo guy, was there, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, there's Jimmy Pedro, Dave Camarillo, you know, Dave Camarillo." Mm-hmm. So on my first judo trip in your, uh, a senior team on the Australian team to US Open when I was in year 12, he flying armbar and broke my coach's arm. Oh, wow. Dave Camarillo did. Wow. Um, and um, yeah, so that was like, whoa. And then he lost it. And then there was like a guy called Chuck Jefferson and Jimmy Pedro. Got to see all those guys fight. It was just Ryan Reesa. It was just cool. Seeing all yeah. those top big names in judo that I kind of saw online for a long time and all the DVDs. And Yeah, that's cool. Then, that's cool. On this one trip, we went to Canada and uh, trained at a place. I don't know what it's called, but... Nicholas Gill was there. He was like second in the Olympics. He would have been a world medalist a few times. We were playing this game and he had his shirt off. He's like this big gorilla guy. He's like running at me, trying to tackle me. And I was like, I was like, mom, Nicholas Gill tried to tackle me. That's crazy. You know, yeah, that's great. That's cool. Awesome. And, and you said that you were in the shadow team for the Atlantic, Atlanta Athens, Olympics? Athens, Athens. Athens, sorry, sorry. Athens Olympics. How, how does that come about to be on the shadow team for that? Is it just a positioning thing or? Yeah, so back then to make the Olympics, you had to pretty much qualify through your region, which ours was Oceania. Yeah. Um, now to make the Olympics, it's much harder. You've got to, you've got to be top 18 in the world. Okay. Qualify. So, um, but back then for, for Sydney, for Sydney, we all got, anyway, for Athens, um, you had to be the number one in the, in the region. So, and around that time, there was a guy called Frankie. There was my training partner, Scott. There was Stephen Gaddis and there was me. And uh, I was the youngest. I was 17. They were all a lot older, like adults. Mm. Um, and around that time, I'd beaten them all at a few tournaments and, and that sort of stuff. So I got on the shadow team. So when I was in year 12, my friend and I went to the Australian uh, Institute of Sport. I got to try on all the uniform, like the Athens gear. And oh, so you're, you're like, you're in it. You're, you're, you're in it. You're ready to go. And then you leave and you're like, hang on a minute. I haven't even, I haven't even qualified. And I didn't even qualify. Like, you get yeah. you stay fake because they suck you in. And then you're yeah. like, oh, it was just funny. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. so, so they, you kind of, you and what are you the shadow for? So is it in case of the, but, one of the Australian competitors can't go? Yeah. So pretty much there was for, to make the Oceania. So back then to make the Olympics, there was three tournaments that would get, that you'd get points at to make the Olympics. US Open was one of them, yep. the world championships and the Oceania championships. So you and I, and another, you know, everyone in your weight division, you competed all three of them and whoever had the most points, I would go to the Olympics for the Oceania okay. region. So only one from Oceania per weight division could go. Yeah. And um, US Open, we all lost first round except for Scott. He beat like a green belt. Yeah. He, and then Worlds, I didn't go and everyone lost first round. And then Oceania, um, I was ranked fourth in the division and they set the top three. So I didn't get to fight at the last Olympic selection tournament. Yeah. In which case I didn't get it. I wouldn't have gathered enough points to, to make the Olympics. So that's how I made the shadow team. Yeah. I was okay. Close, but not quite to make that last one. 
Yeah. And what, what would have to happen for you to go to, to the Olympics in that sta- at that stage? Uh, oh, well, well, pretty much it'd be non-existent. So, oh, okay. Yeah, like, in order to gather, unless I won the world or did something crazy. Yeah, right. Um, pretty much had to gather. There's three tournaments to gather as many points as you could. Yeah. And if you don't do, if you, if you do one of the tournaments and you don't do well, you're probably not going to make it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, no worries. All right. And then, so that's, so four years later would be the Olympics Games that you, that you do qualify for. So talk us, talk us through what happens in those four years. Yeah, so pretty much um, for that, the one beforehand, and actually a good little segue is the Islanders, like Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, they actually couldn't get into America. So they couldn't fight at the US Open, in which case they couldn't gather enough points to make the Olympics. Yep. So they changed the selection for us. So it now became um, the Oceania World Cup, Oceania Championships, and the World Championships were the three places you could gather points for. So for our region. So I went to... I won the Oceania Championships twice. I think I came maybe 11th or 9th at the Worlds. And I, I, gathered, I pretty much won both Oceania Championships, which qualified my sport at the Olympic Games. Okay. Uh, in Beijing 2008. Yeah, okay. And then for London, they changed it to the top 22 in the world um, to make the Olympics. Um, and after two years, um, me and another Aussie guy were... I was like 25th in the world. He was like 28th. And at the very last tournament, whoever won would make the Olympics and he beat me. So he dropped to 21st in the world and I went up to like 29th in the world. So I didn't qualify. Yeah, okay. okay. Now it's top 18, it's even harder. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and so to, how far did you know that you had qualified for the Olympics before the, before the Olympics? Yeah, so I, I qualified on Good Friday. We actually had, the tournament was on Good Friday, which okay. I thought was really funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in New Zealand, it was on Good Friday. I qualified for the Olympics. And then, um, so it must have been like March, April, and the yep. Olympics was in July. Um, and there was, nothing was open to celebrate dinner. We just had Maccas. Nothing <laughs> open on Good Friday. Oh, there you go. There you go. Nothing like celebrating a, a physical endeavor than, than some Maccas. Yeah. And some Maccas. That's great. And yeah. then, so what, what changes when you qualify for the Olympics in judo? Oh, you just, firstly, you feel relieved that you, yeah. the selection's finished. And then I came home. I had a knee operation to fix my knee because it was injured. Wow. Okay. And then, um, and then, yeah, we just went overseas to, um, we went to Korea for three weeks, uh, got absolutely slaughtered, came home uh, for a little while. Then we had like a, a, a camp at the AIS, like a national training camp. Yeah. We went to Japan for like three weeks and then Germany. And okay. Then, Came home for a bit and then we went to the Olympics. You know? Now, is that a, is that a, the, the traveling abroad for, so, so I assume this is the people that are going to the Olympics are yeah, now yeah. Are traveling abroad. Yeah, yeah. so the Australian yeah. Olympic Committee pay for your trips to go all over there. And is that, and is that because the, the level is just not there in Australia to get what you need to, to, to compete at the Olympics? Is that yeah, the purpose of the trips? So when you go to Japan, there's like Japan invented judo. Um, and there's just JoJo's everywhere. And yeah. the bigger JoJo's, there's like between 100 and 400 judo players. They're all black belts. They all train six days a week for three hours. And there's all weight divisions. So from 60 kilos up to 150 kilos. So you can essentially send a whole team and we'll all have 10 to 15 training partners each. Yeah, um, right. So, yeah, that's is, what, a, yeah. is there a head coach of that, that Australian judo team now? Yeah, yeah. And did you know that person before you qualify? Yeah, so usually that coach would be with you for the kind of those, those two to four year sure. period. Yeah. Oh, but for a two to four year period? Yeah, like it all depends because it's a big commitment on their part too because they don't get paid anything, I don't think. Yeah, right. Um, so they've got to take time off work just to go. So we had a coach, Gavin Kelly, who was a reserve for five Olympics. Yeah, so right. knows what's going on. And so he was our coach right through. Um, and was, so was he your normal competition coach before you would qualify for the Olympics? Yeah, he was our coach at all the big tournaments. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so what, I mean, you, you, you describe that sense of relief, but it must have been just in a sense of achievement. You've been doing this sport since you were five. And how old were you when you qualified and went to the Olympics? 21, 22, yeah. So, you know, the vast majority of your life, you've been aiming for this, this moment. Yeah. Can you just describe that feeling? I mean, how did, how did you tell people, you know, what, what did, did yeah. things change? Well, it's kind of a weird one, hey, because I qualified and then I kind of, I wasn't overly happy. I was relieved, but it was more that I kind of knew I was going to qualify. Like, 
there was no doubt in my mind. I trained so hard um, that I kind of knew I qualified. So it wasn't a, it was more of a, oh, now I'm qualified, but I knew I was going to qualify anyway, just because I don't know, I was just very one track minded. Like yeah. I'm going to train so hard that there is going to be no way in the world that I'm not going to qualify. Okay. Um, so it was a bit more, it was a bit weird. It was a bit, it was like a cool, done. Now let's move on to the Olympics. Like it wasn't a, crazy like oh my gosh, oh my gosh oh, i can't believe i made it like i kind of yeah 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 we're going to so yeah yeah and is that is that is that just the, the mechanics of the qualification or was that just your mindset i think it was just my mindset because anything can happen at any time in judo yeah that's um, what i thought even in the final match the guy dropped for like a drop fireman's carry yeah and i kind of defended it defended it defended it defended it and then he rolled rolled me over my back but the referee didn't score it but the referee could have easily maybe not easily it was one of those ones of Oh, was it a score? Was it not? But if it was a score, I would have lost the match and not gone. So, yeah, right. you know, it's one of those ones of, you know, the judo's, you know, anything can happen at any time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. And then, so you, you get selected, you go abroad three times, you do the training, and then, and then the Olympics are on. So talk to us about getting to Beijing. What's it like? What's the, what's the accommodation like? What, yeah. And, um, and you know, I saw, in fact, I saw a picture of, on Instagram you put up of you at the opening ceremony to, tell, yeah. to describe everything behind that picture and then yeah, yeah. that picture. Well, that was actually the closing ceremony. Oh, because, sorry, closing. Um, no, no, the only because um, I was on judos in the first week and I'm the last weight division, so I'm day one. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Day okay. one. And so, yeah, but the Olympics in general is, is incredible. There's famous people like, you know, but it's funny when I talk to kids at school now, like there were so many famous people like Ian Thorpe, they're like, Who's Ian Thought? Who's that dude? Yeah. You know, was, so I've met so many people. I met like Messi, um, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant was there. Wow, oh, that's cool. That, that was when it was like, like when you saw that, the dream team, yeah. then you're like, whoa, like we're, we're at the Olympics. Because yeah. even Roger Federer and that's like, the dream team, and he's taking photos. Like, <laughs> even, you know, even Federer is taking photos of the dream team. That's when you know that there's famous people in town. Was this, was this in the, in the, the opening cafeteria. ceremony? Like yeah, as, in the cafeteria. Wow, like, that's so cool. Yeah, so me and my friend Brownie, who made the weight division above, he called the weight division we would um, just hang out all day in the cafeteria. There's Leighton Hewitt, there's Casey Delacqua, you know, there's Ian Thorpe, and there's... Um, Kid Elevens, like oh, so many, you know, the Williams sisters, and we go and get photos with them, all that sort of stuff. And but then I was on day one of the Olympics, so because I just saw her to make weight, oh, well, I had to make weight. Actually, didn't saw her for Beijing. I just ran and skipped. Yep. And, um, made weight. So I, the Olympic ceremony, you get home at like one, two a.m. and we had to weigh in at six a.m. So. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. So I just weighed in, um, and and then competed. So the closing ceremony was that. Where's that photo? That photo that? came from. Yeah. Cool. And what was the what, what, sorry, sorry, mate. To say the weird thing is, is judo is all done on one day. So you have six fights all in one day or five fights. You either, you know, I lost first round to a guy from Greece, but on day two or day three of the Olympics, you meet other Aussies. They're like, have you competed yet? I'm like, oh, I'm being and done like yesterday. They're like, what do you mean? You finished in one day? Yeah. They're like, that's weird. So day two of the Olympics, my judo, my Olympic career is finished. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's really yeah. weird. Where other sports, you play a soccer game a day for the first week and, judo is just even boxing you have you know you have one fight then you fight the next day and the next day if yeah. you're winning judo is all in one day so it's a bit different yeah absolutely and and so talk talk us through that fight with with the the guy from greece and and sort of how it went down and what you felt afterwards and and all yeah. the context yeah so i fought um this greek guy and i was still pretty young in my judo like i still didn't like i i re i showed the kids in my class the other day like the fight and i'm just watching it going oh, man i had no idea what i was doing still at that level i had wow. no deep understanding of judo for london i was a triple times better judo player but i didn't wow. know that. um and even now i'm a quadruple better player now just like we do you know you know so much more but your body just can't hang on or you mentally just can't hang on or you know life goes on but um yeah so i drew a guy from greece first round um and um he was a georgian that fought for greece and he was really good at pickups and uh, he was really tall. And I fought a bit bent over because I was like a fireman's carry, double leg sort of judo player. Yeah. Um, and um, so I was fighting a bit bent over and he just pretty much grabbed my leg and threw me with a throw called Obi Otoshi, but it's like a hub rally thing. And I was a little bit annoyed because we spent so much time in Japan that they, they don't do throws like Georgians do. Like we spent so much time in Japan that we, we fight a classical style of judo. Yeah. 
there's only one Japanese per weight division at the Olympics. Like, um, where if you go to Europe, there's so many different styles of judo and there's Russians and Georgians and there's, you know, all different styles. So I kind of wish if I went back, I'd spend more time in Europe than I would in Japan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I lost the match. Um, he threw him on my back. That was it. Game over. Yeah. Um, I just wanted another crack. Like, I was just like, oh, I just want one more crack just to have a go. But judo, he lost next round to a, the world champion. So yeah. I, I got eliminated from the tournament. So that was it. So I was pretty sad. Yeah. Um, I always tell people that fighting at the Olympics is like getting the interview for your dream job. Like you got the interview, but you didn't get the job. Like I yeah. really wanted to get a medal, but you don't, you go there and have a shot, but you just don't get it. Like, it's, yeah. yeah. And then, and then what was the plan sort of after that? I, I suppose yeah. you, you mentioned um, the next Olympics. Was it, was that, did your focus then change? All right. Four yeah, years so time. Then, it's my time. Yeah. So then after the Olympics, um, I got married. Um, so I think in December we got married my wife and I, and then, um, and then I enrolled in university to become a primary school teacher. Um, so then I started doing, and then yeah, London was, I always wanted to go to two Olympic games. Uh, and, um, yeah, so I started training towards, towards London. Um, and then in 2010, um, in 2009, I won a really big tournament, um, that no Australian guy has won, um, which is really cool. And what, then, what tournament's that? It's called the Pack Rim Championship. So it was just like a, I read about that. Yeah, yeah. So I won that tournament um, and uh, beat a Japanese guy in the final, that sort of stuff, which is really cool. And um, and then in 2010, judo changed the rules. So fireman's carries were now illegal, double legs were now illegal. And that was my main style of judo was double yeah, legs. Right. So um, I'd go to training and I couldn't like, I couldn't throw a green belt with any yeah. throw because I was so honed in on fireman's carries and double legs and pickups. So then I was thinking about switching to wrestling because in wrestling you can do double legs if I was carries that sort of um, But I stuck with judo and then tried to, you know, was doing my degree at the same time as uni, uh, at the same time as trying to make London. And um, yeah, tried to make London, but didn't get there. And then after yeah. I moved out of London, I, a month later I tried to make it for wrestling because we qualified. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I, I, I was super fit. Um, just missed out by a little bit, but the guy that beat me was a phenomenal judo player. Arnie Dickens, like very, very good judo player. Like he just, just kept getting better and better. <laughs> it was, it was a really good judo player. So he beat me in the final. He went to the Olympics. And then, um, about three weeks after that tournament that I lost to qualify, the president of ACT wrestling rang me and said, Matt, we've qualified. Australia's qualified one spot for the Olympics and it's your weight division. Do you want to have a shot? So I was yeah, like, yep. right. so I went straight back to into wrestling, got the tights on and went back into wrestling. Cause I wrestled a little bit in like high school and stuff. And then, um, and then I lost both my matches at the nationals. So whoever, so a guy called Farzad qualified Australia, the spot but yeah. for a lot of sports, you don't, you don't qualify the spot. You qualify your nation, the spot and the nation choose who to send. Wow, it's like, it's like the Australian political party. You sort of sort of win the spot and they decide. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it happens in like like in the moment, like in Japan, uh, they take the top eighteen in the world. But if there's three Japanese, it'll drop to the top twenty one in the world because they're going to send one. So in some divisions at the moment, or even like Russians and Georgians, some of them are like first, second, third in the world, but only one can go to the Olympics. Yeah. So okay. So you qualify the nation. So this wrestler Farzad, he qualified Australia the spot. And then he had to go to the nationals to reclaim the spot he qualified. Wow. That's crazy, man. And I think the rules was if he wins, he goes. If he comes any other place, the next day, whoever wins that nationals, they fight him the best out of three. Yeah. He won the nationals and he got to qualify for the Olympics. So pretty cool. But I had a shot. Didn't get there. But mate, talk us through talk us through transitioning from man, competing for Olympic judo and then Olympic wrestling, like just the mechanics of that. Is, is it, is it, I mean, is it like, you know, apples and oranges or we're, we're pretty, we're pretty close. Oh, big time. Like I wrestled my heart. I placed second at the nationals in 2010 okay. wrestling. So I've wrestled enough to place at the nationals, but um, yeah, it's definitely a lot different. I like fireman's carries. I like double legs um, back then. Um, but really I was still clutching at straws. Like the, the top wrestlers, are, they're very good. Yeah, like really good. But um, I fought Farzad once before. We've had a few matches. Uh, he beat me for the in 2010, I think, for the gold medal. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I was clutching at straws, but I was getting a crack. I yeah, for strong. sure. 
Um, it was my weight division. I was still light on weight. I, I wasn't heavy, so I thought I may as well. There's you got nothing to lose. But yeah. at that nationals, all the 66 kilo guys all cut weight to 60 kilos. So it was all the best 60 kilo guys and all the best division above all in one. It was there's so many top dudes in that division. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, so while whilst this is happening, you said you you're going to university and the plan, and you said olympics and then you're gonna you're gonna go to uni and the plan was to be a teacher yeah a primary school teacher i assume yeah yeah so and, i became a teacher yeah awesome and awesome and how i assume that you're great at teaching because you've grown up surrounded by teachers coaches mentors at, at, at the at literally the best levels that you can get okay. um is there a similarity there between between coaching and martial arts and what you do in the classroom yeah for sure yeah yeah, like I think I, I was already also coaching kids' classes from 15 onwards. Yeah, um, okay. And stuff. So, yeah, there is similarities. You just got to love love kids and have yeah. fun with kids and have fun and joke around with them and get to know them. Um, uh, and I think that's the, the, yeah, it's fun. It is fun. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, we got, we, I just looked at the clock. We haven't talked about jujitsu once yet, which is great. I love it. I love it. So if you're still listening, you're, 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 you're welcome. Um, so Matt, when does BJJ come on the scene for you? Yeah, so as I was uh, trying to make uh, Beijing, I was working at a gym called the Underground Gym in Western Creek, which had Krav Maga, Taekwondo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, boxing kickboxing it had this it was this called the underground gym or determination fitness Center. it was the best job i still miss it today yeah. so what's this brazilian jiu-jitsu thing and john will ran a seminar there i remember meeting him and uh i'm like oh this is like this is just groundwork like judo it's the exact yeah. same because back then it kind of was like back then uh, it was just judo like but now it's evolved into spider guard x like it's just next level it's jiu-jitsu now it's not judo anymore if you know what i mean yeah. so I, and I went along there and just just did groundwork for a little bit. Um, and then I just dabbled in it on and off. Yeah. Um, and then we went to the ANU. Because at that stage, the highest belt in Canberra was a blue belt. Yeah. Um, and which was Danny Weir, which he runs Epic in, in Woden there. Yeah. Um, and there was like uh, Ben Langford and Roger and um, all these guys still do jiu-jitsu jiu now, which is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're all black belts and stuff like that. So yeah, and then I just started dabbling in jiu-jitsu um, just as a supplement to judo. So like you know, we talked about before about competitive training. Yeah. Um, sometimes it gets hard having to constantly go to judo and be competing. So I went and did wrestling because it was fun. I could joke around at wrestling and have fun. I could go to jiu-jitsu and just joke around and have fun. It's like judo, but it's fun. Where yep. judo was serious. There was no fun at judo. It was just serious. So uh, I just dabbled in jiu-jitsu and just had fun with it. And um, yeah. And then yeah. I met Daniel Kelly in 2000 and it must have been 2007. And he fights in the UFC. He's been to four Olympics for judo. And he said, if he discovered jiu-jitsu 10 years ago, he would have started it then because it's so good for your ground game. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to do jiu-jitsu every week now. So I just kind of started from there. Yeah. Cool. And so when, when, when did you start full-time jiu-jitsu? Uh, I kind of just did it all the time. Yeah, okay. Like with mates and stuff like that. Um, so I don't really know when I did it full time. I kind of just did it. Yeah, yeah. And it must have, mustn't have taken you long based off your grappling background, you know, wrestling as well as judo to quickly advance up your, your belt ranks. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I started competing straight away at purple belt um, just because it's a bit unfair competing at blue belt when I was high level. Especially this is back in the day when jiu-jitsu wasn't that popular. Like a tournament would be like 100 people. But now there's 600 people. Like it's still, it was still developing in Australia. So um, yeah, I did heaps of tournaments, but I did heaps of tournaments and I won heaps of tournaments. Yeah. With literally just judo. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I started playing jiu-jitsu. Then I didn't win a tournament for ages. Yeah. Well, it's, it's that, because I started playing jiu-jitsu, I started, I was good at judo and I could win jiu-jitsu tournaments. But when I started playing jiu-jitsu, I would lose all the time. And, but then I started winning. So it kind of took a bit of, developing my jiu-jitsu so my judo was winning tournaments yeah but my jiu-jitsu wasn't winning jiu-jitsu tournaments but now my jiu-jitsu wins jiu-jitsu tournaments which is really cool you gotta you gotta break that down for for people for us so yeah. i i can kind of get that with your so you you is this before or after beijing after this is so sorry after beijing oh, yeah i get confused i think my first jiu-jitsu tournament was 2007 i think okay. i was a purple belt Okay, I, think, I get confused. So you just you you immediately enter competition jujitsu as yeah. a purple belt, which is 
pretty phenomenal, I must say. You sort of just, you, you jump in there. And it makes sense that you're dominating because of your lifetime of judo background. You're competing at the Olympic levels. That, that makes sense. So what, what then is the difference to playing a jiu-jitsu game? Can you explain that to me? Yeah, well, like heaps of the judo guys, you just throw someone and lay on them for five minutes, right? Or you throw them, scramble, stand up, throw them. So you're winning through just sheer throwing or yeah. sheer, like, and um, there's a, do you know Travis Stevens, a jiu-jitsu guy, judo black belt? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's videos of him entering jiu-jitsu tournaments and he's pulling guard. And everyone's like, he's an Olympic judo player. And he said, I do jiu-jitsu to work on my jiu-jitsu. Like, I don't want to be yeah, winning tournaments right. growing. That's what judo's for, even though it's a grand game of judo. But he's pulling guard, he's leg locking people. Because um, he said jiu-jitsu, I want to win through jiu-jitsu. And so for me, I was winning tournaments through fireman's carries and throwing guys and all that. But I wasn't submitting anyone. So... Um, right. Then I started, you know, submitting people and my coach had gave me my purple belt. Adam, I, I competed. It must have been a purple or brown belt. And he said to me, um, hey, Matt, you're jiu-jitsu guy. You actually start to look at, you're looking like a jiu-jitsu guy now. <laughs> um, but before, you were, just a judo, you were just a judo guy and a jiu-jitsu guy. But now, you look like you can do jiu-jitsu. Like, because there is a difference, you know, like, um, I can play a bit of spy guard. I can play X guard. I can play some De La Hiva and that sort of stuff where before, I was reckoned dudes just throwing them and laying on them and mauling them into some sort of armbar. But now I've got finesse and smoothness. At least I hope I do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, so yeah. So it's that element between, and I remember one of the tournaments I did, I got a guy in mount and I was winning 10 nil and I thought, Oh, I can just lay on him. And he, he won't escape and I'll just win the match. And I thought, as I was on him, I thought to myself, Matt, you're doing jujitsu, work a sub, like actually sub the guy. You can hold him for five minutes and win the match, but that's not going to get you better at jiu-jitsu. It's going to be a boring match and you're not going to develop. So I started going for a collar choke and he bridge and rolled. And I was like, Matt, don't, but I'm actually doing jiu-jitsu because I want to sub people, not to just win matches. So, yeah. you know, but that's because I'm now going back into the, I want to develop as a martial artist opposed to winning tournaments. Yeah. And, and, and it must, if I, that, if I had that mindset 10 years ago, when the judo federation removed my leg grabs, I would have had more attacks to win more tournaments with. But because I was so focused on winning using three movements, when those movements are taken away, I had nothing left. So yeah. I was more of a martial artist and more, okay, I'm, I'm good at those three moves. Now let's work these three moves. And if I get injured or you, you have an operation or you get a bit slower because you get older or you get weaker, what are you going to fall back on? So I found after my judo career, once I stopped doing power weight training, once I stopped doing sprints, once I stopped doing box jumps, once I stopped doing speed training, I realized my technique sucked. I just won through determination, speed, and fitness. I didn't win necessarily through technical prowess and ability. So, because um, I was winning tournaments, it's masked when you win tournaments. Mm. That, oh, you're really good at technique. You're good at, you're good at whatever because you win tournaments. It's not actually accurate. Um, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, so that's the difference between judo guys can, I always kind of say like, jiu-jitsu is there, you're not, you don't just throw and stand up, throw and stand up, that's not jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu is you got to get a submission. So, yeah, this yeah. makes, this makes, I mean, if we've come full circle, I, at the very start, I was so confused when you were talking about, you know, jiu-jitsu and then this sort of competition jiu-jitsu and you're like, oh, I can, you know, competitions yeah, that you can, you can, you can train to just win competitions. This is exactly what you're talking about now. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. And do you, do you, do you have students that are purely just there for the competition and, and not there for the, the recreational, the learning of, of becoming yeah. this full jiu-jitsu player? And do you try to get them to be more holistic or you just kind of, you give them what they want to focus on? Uh, I actually think because of my experience, um, they are competitive, but they've taken my advice to keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. Don't fall into the trap of, you know, because all it takes is one knee recall and your speed's gone. One shoulder operation and all of a sudden your power's gone. Like, so I've definitely got some competitive guys um, that wreck me. <laughs> Literally yeah, my students, yeah, yeah. some of them are just destroying me now, which is awesome. Um, but it's like, okay, you're destroying me with your best moves. Now start destroying me with your third and fourth best moves. Like, yeah. let's remove those ones. And I always kind of say, even I hate saying, I hate using the word belts, but um, you kind of say in jiu-jitsu, it's good to know, like, if you get someone in a triangle, like don't stop them with a triangle, just do a triangle, then an armbar. 
they switch it to an platter. Then let them re-roll and come up to S mount. And, and sometimes I roll for weeks without subbing anyone. And then, but does that matter? No, because I'm flowing and I'm getting the, the chain of attacks. And that's what's really important because as you get a, as you're fighting better and better people, you're not going to sub them at step one. You're going to sub them at step 10. So yeah. you've got to continually allow them to escape, 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 um, and flow with them. But if you're competitive, I subbed him five times. Well, that's cool. But what if you can't sub him five times with the same move? So what's your next move? What's your next move? What's your next? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I love how you describe that as being a true martial artist, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And, and a real sort of stoic and, and humbled and um, open-minded approach to it. When, 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 when did Matt Daquino arrive to this sort of mindset? Way too late. <laughs> way too late. hundred percent. Way too late. Yeah. Because for years I grew up with like, like I could beat you. So you literally can't teach me anything. Yeah. Like, yeah. Be those, you know, they'd be like those older guys come in that they like give you some sort of advice. You go, and you'd literally be like, shut up old man. I can smash you. Like you got, yeah. right. And now I look back and go, Oh man, I remember he taught me that 20 years ago. Now I'm teaching it now. Imagine if I took it on back then, yeah. the player would I be then? I'd be a yeah. way better judo player, a yeah. way better. Like, but I was just too, if you win tournaments, I like it masks your mistakes. Yeah, for I'm sure. Working, like, but if you lose, you what are the mistakes? What am I working on? Like, but if you yeah. win all the time, you you lose that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless absolutely. someone can actually tell you, um, um, yes, you won, but look at all these problems you made, and let's actually address them. So I remember I did a tournament once, 2010 Junior uh, at Nationals for Judo. I did the same move every match. Same move, throw. I won the match. Next one, same move, throw. Same move, throw. Same move, throw. And that's all I did. Then I won the nationals. Everyone was like, "Yeah, great job!" And I was like, "I fought terribly. Mm. I did one move the entire the entire every match." Mm. Then the next tournament I went in, um, I said to my wife on the drive there, "I said I need to do other attacks." Mm. I ended up winning the tournament by in the final. I made a I won by a really small amount against a German guy that was living in Brisbane. But I said, "But I was doing." I was doing shoulder throws and hip throws and leg attacks. I was doing groundwork. And even though I won by a little bit, I, I was way better. Yeah. Showed actually what I can do. So, but even if I lost that tournament, I would have performed better. And we really want to be performance based, not result based. So, yeah, I love it. That's so profound, man. You know, and it's something it, it, I would say it's, you know, it's just, I can, I can hear you becoming wise, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through, through all these life lessons and just, and I just can't help but to think what an amazing, amazing, amazing thing that you can give to people now, you know, use my journey to better you and let me make you a better person now. Yeah. Don't wait till you go through the experiences I've gone through. That's, that's so profound. That's really cool. Well, some of my students, they know way more than I did. Like, quadruple the amount of knowledge I knew at the same age because I've just given it all to them and now they're taking it and they're like, I just tell it because, you know, at Jiu-Jitsu, I like, I teach you De La Hiva and someone else reverse De La Hiva and in six months, they're teaching me. I hey, Matt, I've taken what you've taught me and I've learned this, this, is this. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Like, I can't, I don't know everything, but they and then they're teaching me and now I'm like, yeah. oh, that's awesome. So it's just really cool. That is, that is super cool. So Matt, talk us through um, when you get your... Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. Now, th- this has got to be, this has got to be a, a strange thing compared to the normal people I speak to on this show because you, you've been such a you know world class black belt in judo already. So, and, and then you start a purple belt to you know. So that it's a bit of an unorthodox story. So talk us through your brown and then and then how you get to your black belt. Yeah. So um, yeah. Well, um, my coach uh, Philippe. So I met Philippe um in probably seven eight years ago. Um, Philippe Grace from Jiu Jitsu Kingdom. And uh, just really liked him, liked his approach to jiu-jitsu, liked the fact that when he runs seminars, he goes three hours overtime every time. He just <laughs> yeah. loves people, loves jiu-jitsu, he can break it down. And he really helped shape to me. He always, in all his seminars, he goes, okay, this will work if you're bigger and stronger than them. But we want to be beating bigger, stronger people that are better than us. That's, that's like the, the, that's technique, is beating bigger, stronger, and better people than us using this technique. If this technique doesn't work on someone your size, great. Does it work on someone bigger? Or doesn't work on someone bigger than you? Then don't do it. Like only do stuff that doesn't require speed, strength, power, flexibility. He calls it like no attribute jujitsu. Oh, I love that. So you know some moves are like, oh, you got to be flexible to do this. 
well, you've got to be strong to do this. You've got to have really good leg just to, now he's like to remove all that. We want to be teaching people jujitsu, which is the foundation of just technique overcomes power through leverage and timing. So anyway, he really helped reshape my judo teaching and my jujitsu teaching and, and my approach to it all. So it was really cool. Um, so I met him and we got along really well. So I came under him. He offered me my brown belt um, a, a while ago because I'd won a lot of purple belt tournaments. And I said, nah, 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 like I'm definitely not a purple, a brown belt yet. Um, so I turned him down and then um, he's like, okay. And I wasn't sure whether he got annoyed at me. And I think maybe two years later, um, yeah. when I developed a lot more, like my jujitsu had, I looked more, he awarded me my brown belt. And then um, three years later, he awarded me my black belt. And even then I was a bit like, oh, I don't think I'm a black belt. I don't know enough. And he goes, Matt, you'll never know enough. Like there's no, yeah. you're constantly learning. We're constantly white belts. You know, yeah. And I was like, yeah, okay, well, um, but you don't have to. Like, it's like, you know, so uh, he wanted me my uh, black belt. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it was really cool. And I'm, I'm proud to be one of, he's given out three black belts and I'm one of them. And I'm, I'm proud to be a black belt that's coming under him for sure. That's cool. That's cool. And when you say he offered you, <laughs> when you say he offered you your brown belt, did he just like, hey, Matt, I think you should be a brown belt? Or was it, was it an awkward presentation? You're like, no, no, I'm good. Thanks. Oh, well, yeah, because cool, we're just chatting. Because I think, because I, so I did, when I went to jiu-jitsu training, when I started, I wore a white belt. I didn't wear a black belt or a, I wore a white belt. Ben Turnbull from Roots gave me a blue belt. Okay. And then, and then I, my judo coaches ran a gym and then Adam Saunderson gave me a purple belt. And then, um, and so I was competing, even though I was a blue belt officially, I was competing at brand, uh, purple. I even competed at black belt. Um, oh, did you really? Tournaments, yeah. <laughs> and then um, I competed at some, because, um, for one tournament, I competed at Black Belt because it was Abu Dhabi trials and the divisions were under 85 kilo purple belt or over 85 kilo purple belt. Mm. And I was like, well, I'm 65 kilos. There's no way I can win under 85 kilo purple belt. But the Black Belt division was under 65 kilos. And I was like, I have a better shot at winning under 65 kilo Black Belt than I do at 85 kilo. So I entered, I lost my penalty against a guy called Gustavo Pinto, who's been to three Abu Dhabis. Yeah. Um, very good Brazilian. He beat me by a little bit. Um, and then, um, but yeah, so I, I, anyway, Philippe said, you've been competing at Purple Belt for a really long time, like seven years or something. I think it's time for a brown belt. I was like, oh, nah, like, you know. Um, and he said, I actually really like that you said no, because it shows I'm actually not about the belt. Um, and, and I'm not, like, it's just a belt and fourth degree back belts. It, it just doesn't mean anything. And what yeah. I really like is at my club, I run a, on Monday nights, I run a fundamentals section and an adventure due to. But we call it choose your own adventure because I hate saying uh, white and blue belts over here and purple belts over here. Because let's be honest, purple belts sometimes, or any person, I might have knowledge gaps over here that that person has. And we all have knowledge gaps all over the place, right? So at our club, we call it choose your own adventure. So we go, hey guys, tonight, Rich is teaching knee ride escapes and Matt's over here teaching side control escapes. Choose your own adventure. And the, some white belts will go, oh, I'm pretty good at near right escapes, but my side control escapes suck. I'm go, and the brand belts go, oh man, my side control is pretty good, but my knee right sucks. So we, it's choose your own adventure because there's no such thing as a black belt move and a white belt move. And it's just all, it's just all nothing. Yeah. But what I like about it is um, when I first got my black belt, these people come in and I go, hey guys, tonight, James is running our bars from guard and I'm running. So we do like submissions. He's doing our bars from guard and I'm doing ankle locks. And I have, even though I, I missed a black belt, I'll have six people come to me and 15 will stay with the blue belt. Yeah. Because at my club, it's not about the belt. And I love the fact that people are like, oh, well, I'm going to go with the black belt because he's a black belt. People go, are they, they're, they're really rewarding knowledge rather mm. than a person's belt. And so that's what I love about my club. Like everyone can teach everyone. Um, and we're not going, I just really like that approach. And I think, um, so Philippe was going, yeah, so I, you know, you're not, I'm not a belt hunter. I'm just a knowledge gatherer. And, yeah, no, that's um, cool. I love that concept. I love that concept. Yeah. So God, well, one of my coaches, uh, he said, nah, don't, don't separate the belts because it, it's just stupid because we all have knowledge gaps. I've got blue belts teaching me some leg lock stuff. Yeah. I've got some of my blue belts but, and I've removed that completely. I have some people who teach me knee right escapes. I have some people who teach me leg locks, regardless of belt. Doesn't matter. Yeah. The white belt teach me stuff because they're a person that knows stuff that I don't. They yeah. teach. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's really cool. Really so, cool. And do you think, do you think you've come to that because you came to jujitsu at such a high caliber of grappling? You know what I mean? So that you didn't have to go through the traditional, oh, you, I was a white belt, I knew nothing. And then I learned some stuff and I was a blue. You kind of came with such a, such a background of knowledge or is this just, just something that's sort of come to you? I think, I think I'm pretty, like I'm humble. Like I'm a humble person. And I think I just realized the mistake of not um, respecting someone's knowledge just because of the belt they wear. Yeah. Or on the flip side, respecting someone because of the belt they wear, even though they're a horrendous human being. Yeah. Right. So remove, don't be a belt. Like people, I, I say, um, people, um, I honor someone for who they are, not for what belt they have. Mm. So I actually respect you for who you are, not for what belt you have. Mm. So if someone comes in and goes, Oh, I'm a black belt. Can I run your passes? No, I don't even know who you are as a person yeah. or, you know, and so, um, it's just really important. So I just respect and people know stuff. And yeah. I've learned so much stuff from people that have done jiu-jitsu for six months because they watch videos. Hey, Matt, I saw this really cool sweep from God. I'll show us. Oh, I've never seen that before. Like, it's just, you know, rather than going, shut up, you don't know anything. Like, you know, so I think the more open you are and the more humble you are, actually more you learn. Yeah. And the more people feel like they have a voice and that sort of stuff. And rather than saying, I'm the boss and everyone do it my way, because there's no such thing as, like, my way. Like, the principles principles of every move don't change but the applications can change there's no one way to do anything yeah yeah, yeah. it's a very egalitarian approach to to it you know what i mean mm -hmm. and in many ways it's sort of very aligned with the concept of jiu-jitsu jiu-jitsu I, I get a blue belt you assume that i know a certain amount of things you assume that i can hold my own with blue belt purple etc cetera, etc cetera. but mm -hmm. you're kind of flipping it from an instructional perspective, you know what I mean? Just because I wear a blue belt doesn't mean I can't teach someone that's higher, which I think a lot of people will find very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, this, this could be where jujitsu is at, you know, we, when, with such a, an integration of all these different grappling arts. I love it. I think it's such a fascinating ap approach to it. And I love that concept. Just because I don't have a belt, don't judge me. Just because I do have a belt, don't judge me. It's... Yeah. Wait till you get to know me, and then and then you can judge me. You're gonna you can apply that to life, you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's not just jujitsu. I yeah. love it. What a great concept. Yeah, they, but, that's right. Because yeah, I mean, I've been wrecked by some blue belts. Yeah. And then yeah, I yeah. and then I've wrecked some black belts, and you go, who cares? <laughs> like yeah. he tried his best, and I tried my best. How cool are we that we both tried our best? Yeah, that's, that's the respectable right. part, not the winning or the losing. It's just the fact that. We both, that's why the bow at the start of a judo match signifies, I'm going to give it my all. You're going to give it your all. And thank you for this opportunity to give it our all to each other. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I love it. And, and it reminds me a lot. I was reading a lot about you and, and about what you do out at your, your gym. And you speak about you combine the grappling arts. And I suppose that's, you know, maybe that's why you'll have to tell us that's what where Beyond Grappling came from. Mm -hmm. you, you're combining judo, you're combining wrestling and you're combining mm -hmm. jujitsu. Is, is this a, a kind of a hybrid thing that you're teaching out there? Well, see, judo and jujitsu is the same thing. Okay. It's the same thing. Like, it's just, it's the same thing. It all come from, it's all technique overcomes power through technique, leverage and timing. That's it. It's all the same. It's just applied a little differently. What I liked about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is it was the judo started. Jigoro Kano didn't like leg locks, so he kind of removed them. He didn't like ground grappling, and he actually said something along the lines of, that's what apes and animals crawl on the ground, and we don't do that. So that was his kind of... Anyway, but I love... And then sport judo came in and removed the scissor leg takedown and removed slams from guard. And obviously, safety reasons, yes. But then sport judo came in and changed a lot of rules. They removed fireman's carries. They have removed leg grabs. But jiu-jitsu is the follow-on of that. There is leg locks and there's wrist locks. There's no wrist locks in judo at all. Jigoro Kano wasn't interested. So I love that jiu-jitsu and judo started at the same and it's actually the same thing. It's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, okay. And the focus is just a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. So even in our, um, like on Tuesday nights, I always say to people, uh, like Mod, Mod likes teaching wrestling. I'm like, well, he actually, on Tuesday nights, he does a no-gi class. I'm like, he actually doesn't teach wrestling. He's not a wrestler. He's a jiu-jitsu guy that teaches no-gi stand-up. That doesn't make it wrestling. Wrestling is wrestling, and no-gi stand-up in wrestling is just jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. Jiu like, so, yeah, yeah. grappling and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, just see, and I think it's, it's beyond, because I want to teach beyond the sport. I want to teach goal setting. I want to teach resilience. 
We want to teach healthy eating, healthy lifestyle, getting out there and trying your best. So we're, we're teaching this character development opposed to the skills of judo. Because we all know people that are really good at any sport and you, you wouldn't want your kids to be any of those people because they're arrogant, nasty, mean people. You know, I want all of our coaches are people that I would love my kids to be. So that's why they're my coaches. Um, and, um, and so we're teaching leadership and responsibility and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's just, that's what, that's what, that's what's beyond grappling. It's more than just judo. If you yeah. want to come to our club for judo or jujitsu, then you're missing out because you're going to learn so much more than that. That's really cool. And you can pick that up. I was going to ask you, I, I spent some time looking at your blogs um, on your website on, on the beyond grappling.com. Um, and you are, I would say a prolific blogger. There, there is a lot there. Yeah. Um, and you've been doing it for uh, almost 10 years now. Yeah. Everyone wants to start blogging until they realize it gets pretty boring after the first few. How, how have you stuck with it for so long? What, what drives yeah. you to, to educate well, through these means? When I used to do judo trips, we'd go away and say, I say I got funded the government would give me three grand. I could go to Japan for a month. But while I'm in Japan for a month, I still got a phone bill. I still have rent. I still have insurance to pay. I still have a phone bill. And so I needed to make money somehow. So a friend of mine, and I was blogging for ages, and a friend of mine wrote the first ever paleo diet cookbooks. Huh. And she said, hey, Matt, how about you start blogging? How about you gather a newsletter? And if you want to put something together, we can, I'll help you sell it. And I'll show you how to set up all online. That's, that's how I got started. But I like reading. And so I love writing. I love reading. That's why I write books. Um, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur. I have all these different ideas and yeah. I write them all down. And my wife says, yes. My wife says, no, don't do that one. That one's good. Don't just worry about the ones you've got written down and stop writing down all these ideas. Cause I, I don't have enough time to do it all. Um, <laughs> she's like my filter. But, um, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, and I just write, and I didn't write to make money. I just wrote because it would help people. And, yeah. and I get emails all the time of how much my videos and DVDs and, have helped people. And that's kind of all it's all about. And the reason why I wrote stuff is because when I grew up, I read every book in my state, uh, in the library, every judo book. I read them all. I, I wanted more information, but there was none out there. So I would write it so that now people that are in my situation, like my students, they know way more than I did at their age because I've invested back into the community to, um, with all the information I have. So yeah, that's and I just really like helping cool. people and coaching and teaching and, and I just like writing yeah 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 that's really cool i love it and it's such a wide range of topics listeners if you want to go and check out everything and anything about the grappling arts then, then definitely check out these blogs because you will not run out of things to read yeah actually i was going to say so the reason why i was saying when we were on trips is some trips i would read 10 12 books which is great but what i ended up doing was rather than um reading 10 or 12 books i would write a book and so although I was away not making money, I was spending money on, at home on stuff. I was slowly developing an online presence where I could make money. So yeah. I'd go away for a month, month and I'd make $200. Well, that's cool because that $200, rather than sitting around like people on judo trips, I just watched, or even in the military, 16 seasons of Friends. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. Fun, right? Yeah. When you could actually be doing something that is going to help me out at home. So yeah, yeah. I started blogging. So while they were watching 10 seasons of The Ultimate Fighter, I'm blogging and writing stuff that would hopefully one day help people. They actually, actually help me drive an income as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's really cool. And, and Matt, you know, you're such a, an amazing story of such a really cool journey that that's not finished obviously. And that there's more to go, but when you look back now at what you've been through, what are your highs and what are your lows? Yeah. I think my first high is getting my black belt in uh, judo. So, okay. Uh, when I was 18, I got my black belt, yeah. uh, which is really cool. Tell, tell us about getting a, a black belt in judo. What, is there a lot of tradition behind it? What, 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 what was the ceremony yeah. like? So um, there's, now there's five streams you can get your black belt. There's the competitive stream, which is the main one. Then there's the kata. If you do a few katas, you, get, you can get enough points. But pretty much then there's knowledge and service uh, to coaching that sort of stuff. But um, I pretty much you do tournaments and you gather a certain amount of points in two years. Uh, so you've got to win tournament matches pretty much. So I did that. And I got my black belt. My coach gave me my black belt when I was 15 and I had it on my shelf and I looked at it every day. Like one day, and it's got my name on it. One day, and it's really old and tattered. I've got to stop wearing it. One day I'm going to wear that. And so I finally, um, um, yeah, I got my black belt. So I, I got to wear it. And even when I got my uh, Jiu Jitsu brand belt, I bought the brand belt three, four years before I got one and I have it hanging up in my shed. And so I just do Jiu Jitsu in the shed. 
and I, as a purple belt, but my brown belt would be there. And then, um, and when I got my brown belt, my friend Liam, one of my coaches, said, "Hey, Matt, now you can finally wear that brown belt. It's been hanging in your shed for four years." And so, That's cool. Well, the vote that I had for four years, and now I got to give that to one of my good friends, who's now we promote a Hindu brown belt. And so, um, I actually didn't buy a black a jujitsu black belt though. But I kind of like the idea of I just had it there for so long. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, as a, a reminder, and although you're not going for the belt, it's just like a one day I will. Yeah. You know? So I'm not aiming for belts, but one day I will. And it's even weird that I have two black belts and two different arts. It's just odd. It's just a, that's what McDojo people have. Like, it's yeah. just weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was my first highlight, my judo black belt. Um, so you do tournaments and then you do a kata and then there's a panel of people um, ask you questions and you sh- they go, do this move, do that move, teach us that move, and then you get your black belt. My other highlight was when I was 15, no, yeah, 15, I competed at a tournament. I lost to a New Zealander and I lost to my friend Eva and I, I placed nothing. I came fifth. And then that night was really sad because I, that was just after I got my black belt. So I got my black belt and they say it's the black belt curse. Is you, you spend so much time prepping for your black belt that you don't train hard. And then in your first tournament afterwards, you never win it. And I don't know many people that have won the first tournament after their black belt. It's literally a thing. And, um, and uh, mainly because they spend more time not sparring, but focusing on, on the yeah. And then I came nothing. So the curse happened. And then my mum said to me, Matt, I reckon tomorrow in the senior men, like the open weight division, I reckon you're going to do way better tomorrow. So give it a best shot. The next day, um, I beat uh, a really strong Russian guy in the first round. I beat the four or five time national champion who's like 28 years old. Beat him. Uh, no, I beat him in the final. I strangled him in like 30 seconds. And in the semi final, I beat a guy called Stephen Gadis who I'd never beaten before. So it was cool. That was a highlight because I lost one day, but my mum said, don't worry about it. I reckon tomorrow you're going to do way better. You've got another chance. And I came back and I won. So that was a highlight. That's cool. A black belt. Cool. And then, yeah, winning the Pac Rim Championships is a highlight where I beat this Japanese guy in the final of the. Everyone thought I was going to lose and I won. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what about your lows? Oh, lows. Um, um, not qualifying for the London Olympics was definitely a low because um, I trained so hard and I was so much of a better judo player. That would have been the frustrating part by, by the sounds of it because you knew that you were better than, than where you were in 2008. Oh, yes. Yeah, so much better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that was definitely a, a low. And that's probably it. Yeah. Like, this, yeah. it's all just fun. Yeah, that's great. And, that's and great. I mean, I see these, I go to national training camps and I see these young people trying to make the Olympics. And I'm like, oh, your life's so cool. Because you don't really know how hard life really is. Like, you're just training for yourself. You try and make the Olympics and it's awesome. And it is hard. But um, it's got nothing on the rest of life. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. So, so enjoy it. Enjoy it while yeah. you... Oh, enjoy it, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's it. And there's really no other lows, really. That's just, really cool. Just make, making great friends and, and, um, and, yeah, meeting awesome people and traveling the world. It's just so cool. And, would, and would, you know, in, in retrospect, would you have done anything differently, you think? Uh, I would have gone to Europe a bit more for training. Yeah, okay. And I would have, like I said, learned to be humble and learned to <clears throat> study and, um, and to not work on your strengths, but really try to build on your weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lesson that I don't think, oh, man, I don't know if you can learn that lesson no. because someone else tells you, you know what I mean? You have to, I think you have to come to that in your own everyone, and everyone does. Everyone gets there eventually. Yeah. But um, I mean, the amount of people you must have told that and they just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Matt, whatever. And then, then Shut up, old man. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll get there. Whatever. I'm going to win this comp first. <laughs> oh, that's great. And maybe, maybe started jujitsu earlier, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. I think so as well. Yeah. yeah cool. Cool. Um, and Matt, so what's, what's next for Matt DeQuino? What's yeah, the future um, look like? Oh, hang out with my family. Yeah. And my wife and my kids. Um, and yeah, just keep running the club and keep trying to just motivate and inspire kids and, and teenagers and adults to just chase their dreams. Um, so what's next for the club is I really want to now start moving into that competitive stream, okay. start finding and identifying, because I do love competition. You know, I, I still compete in jiu-jitsu now because I'm just, and I like to show the way. So when, when people go, why are you competing jiu-jitsu on this? I'm like, one, it's fun. And two, my kids have no excuse, uh, as in my judo kids at, at the club. I don't want to compete because there's no, well, I do. So you can too. Like showing them the way, yeah. um, showing them how to win gracefully, showing them how to lose gracefully. Yeah. Um, so really be that kind of role model. Uh, and yeah, just kind of keep growing the club, keep, keep investing in all of them really, but helping the competitors get to that next level, whatever that may be. 
Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right, you know, you're, you're leading by example. Um, you, you put your videos up of your matches, you know, the matches that you win and the matches that you lose. And there's so yeah. many comments on YouTube. I don't know if you see them. There's so many people going, Matt, you know, uh, it just speaks volumes that you're putting this up of you losing this match, you know, yeah. so for, for not only you to learn, but for everyone to learn from. So it's... Um, but like, you lose tournaments, right? Like, it has it, to happen. It's funny that people don't. Like, what? I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I was talking to uh, a coach the other day and I said, I mean, I've got this, I've got this blue belt at my club who just, he tapped me 10 times and he was like, you've got a blue belt that taps you 10 times? Like, I'm like, you don't understand me. This guy's like so strong and fast. He's got these long legs. And he's like, he's like, I'm like, He's like, I can't, believe you, I can't believe you're admitting that. I'm like, but that's the truth. If I didn't admit it, I would just be a liar. Like, we all lose. Who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. And I think that's the reason why that blue belt, I mean, I thought he's now purple. I fought him the other day. He tapped me another 10 times in 10 minutes. Yeah. But I think he stays at our club because he knows, oh, Matt doesn't care. Yeah, I'm actually yeah, yeah. investing. Hey, man, <laughs> you're so freaking good, but you need to work this, this, and this. And so do I. Like, we're all in this learning together. Like, we're all... I'm the leader of the, the culture and the club and the technic, techniques, but I, I don't know everything and I can't know everything. So, yeah, it's kind of... You That's, really cool. That's really Everyone cool. Everyone loses. It's like, it's like the ultimate expression of leave your ego at the door. You know what I mean? It's the first thing I learned when I started YouTube. Leave your ego at the door. Um, and it's the first thing that I've learned that a lot of people say, but they don't actually do. You know what I mean? It's, it's a... And the thing is, is I want my kids to lose and try again. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. if I'm if I don't embrace losing and trying again, then why would my my students or my children themselves do that? Yeah. And so when I started competing, this year's judo nationals, I competed and I came fifth. I, I, I missed a lot of other top level guys, um, but I came fifth at the nationals in senior men in judo. And um one of these a guy I really respect, he said, Matt, why are you competing? And I said, Oh, just for fun, like just because I've gotten better at judo and I want to see how I go. And I also want to make sure that my techniques are still relevant, that what I learned 10 years ago, is it still applicable? Has judo changed? And he said, but all those kids at your club look up to you. What if they see you lose? And I went, what if they see me lose? That's awesome. Yeah. Because they're going to see me lose and try again. Like that, what a message am I sending the students or my own kids if they see me lose and well, they're not going to think I'm invincible. No one is like, like, but I saw, and then I realized, Oh, that's why you retired really early. And that's why you don't spar the guys that can beat you at your club. Oh, that's why you don't, it all makes sense. You know, but if I avoid all the guys that bash me up at the club, I'm not going to get better. And they just think, why are you scared of me? You're only losing. So anyway, I think I've just embraced it's losing. You know, it's, it's fantastic. And, 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 you know, it, you can so easily apply that mindset and that mentality to anything in yeah. life you know what i mean it's um i just love it i think it's fantastic it's really and I think cool. my, my biggest strength in life is i just give stuff a try yeah. oh there's no kids book i'm gonna write one because i'm gonna write one i write one i want to blog because i can i want to because I, I just try and sometimes they bomb out oh whatever i just i just try and if, if i get my kids and my students to try who knows what they'll achieve in life that's so cool yeah. oh, i love it Look, Matt, I gotta, I gotta say, thank you so much um, for for running us through that story, that story about the Olympics, everything around the Olympics, your journey too, but most importantly, your journey afterwards, because it wasn't your defining moment, but it was just one moment in in this incredible story that's behind Matt DeQuino. I've learned so much um, out of this, so much, and it's made me force, you know, while you're talking, I'm thinking about myself, I'm thinking about when I lose, not just in in sport, but in life. And, did I pick myself up? Did I, did I take that opportunity? You know, and I just love, you know, this sense of just absolute humbleness that comes from your story, your application. Um, and, and what I love most about it is it was hard fought. It wasn't something that you've just, you, you, you weren't a humble kid. It's, it's something that you have learned through your journey. And what an amazing thing that you can give and you continue to give um, to people at, at the club and hopefully listens to this podcast and all your blogs and all your books and all your DVDs. Um, I think it's a, an amazing lesson and an amazing story. And listeners, um, I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Behind the Black Belt with Matt DeQuino uh, half as much as I have, because I've, I've certainly had a, a great time 
um, today. So look, if you are ever in Canberra or if you're in Canberra right now and you're looking for somewhere to train, check out Beyond Grappling Club. You can find out all the information at www.beyondgrapplingclub.com and you can find them on all the socials. Uh, check out Facebook at Beyond Grappling Club. You can find uh, Matt and also the club on Twitter at Beyond Grappling and you can also find um, everything on Instagram, uh, look for Beyond Grappling. And you can also find the DVDs uh, from Matt as well. Uh, Matt's DVDs and videos are on BJJ Fanatics and also judofanatics.com. You can find them incredibly easily and just search Matt DeQuino on Amazon and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff there about goal setting, about Matt's Olympic journey. Um, there's journals about how to train, uh, a lot of cool stuff there that you can get all this goodness that is being described by Matt DeQuino. Um, I think you'd be silly if you didn't. And Matt, mate, I can't thank you enough for being on the show, for giving up your time and for just, just opening up and just describing this really, really cool journey to us. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, for myself to be a part of it. Have you got any final words before we wrap up? No, just keep training and having fun. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Matt DeQuino. Ladies and gents, until next time, this is Rich signing off for Behind the Black Belt. Behind the Black Belt is proud to support Veteran Grappling. Veteran Grappling is using the grappling arts to improve the lives of military veterans and first responders. Visit www.veterangrappling.com to learn about scholarship opportunities and more. Join our community on Facebook and our website at www.behindtheblackbelt.com. Behind the Black Belt is a TDP Studios production. Behind the Black Belt is copyright of Richard Thapthing Thong and TDP Studios. The music used in this episode is Rocking Forward by X Take Rux and is used under an Attribution International 4.0 license.